We now want to recap on what we need to deal with cost of capital questions. Now this area, again, we would expect to see each and every time in the exam. And it is particularly important in this exam because there are three articles that have not yet been examined that were written by your examiner. From that perspective, what are we aiming to do with the cost of capital? Well, normally, we're looking for some sort of weighted average cost of capital. So if we start with the WAC, the weighted average cost of capital does what it says in its title. It gives us a cost of capital that is weighted by the appropriate proportions of the debt and equity instruments used. From that perspective, the weighted average cost of capital's use is for investment appraisal purposes. Now, I could get terribly excited about this and tell you that we can only use it for investment appraisal purposes in a certain circumstance. And normally I would do. But your examiner has specifically stated this information in the articles that you must read. And so from that perspective, I'll leave him to answer that rather than you. So how do we calculate it? Well, you have to remember that there is a formula given to you in the formula sheet. So we could say something like this. The WAC equals. Well, it will equal the value of equity over the value of equity plus the value of debt multiplied by the cost of equity plus the value of debt over the value of equity and the value of debt multiplied by the cost of debt. Now, that's all well and good. That's given to you. I must say I don't tend to calculate the WAC that way. Instead, to make it more flexible for the type of questions that you may get, I simply look to do this working. You see, as far as I'm concerned, there are three things that you need to know. You need to know V, which stands for value. You need to know K, which stands for cost and you will need to know VK. So, for example, if we have information for equity and for debt, we would have a value for equity and a value for debt. We would have a KE, a cost of equity figure, and a cost of debt figure, KD. If we multiply the two together, we will get on the one hand, the sum of V here, and on the other hand, the sum of VK here. The reason why I do this is that the WAC is simply going to be the sum of VK over the sum of V. Why do I do this? Well, two reasons. One, I think it is easier for someone to think through that in the heat of battle. But also because the flexibility that the examiner gives you is not much with his formula. He's suggesting that there are only two components, equity and debt. And of course, there could be three or even four components. Because of course, we could have preference shares, if he so wishes, and we could have more than one type of debt. In that circumstance, his formula becomes slightly unwieldy. Whereas with the very simplistic way that we're looking at it, we can keep on adding different aspects to the cost of capital here, and it doesn't materially change things. So that's my suggestion. You certainly don't need to follow it. Now, that's all well and good. But the key about the WAC is getting these two values, the cost of debt and the cost of equity. And most of the work will go towards doing this. So, if that's the case, let's start by looking at the cost of equity and what we need to know. 
KE, the cost of equity. Now, I don't want to teach this. You should know this already. This is simply an aid memoir. From that perspective, what we need to do is we have to remember that there are two calculations. On the one hand, well, let's first of all look at the dividend valuation model. The dividend valuation model, of course, is also known as the dividend growth model. If we're looking at the dividend valuation model, we end up with a formula that we can use. KE equals D1 over PO all plus G. Is this given to you? No. You have to learn this. So, what does all this information mean? Well, as you should remember, KE equals the cost of equity. That is, the rate of return required by the shareholders, or the rate of return offered by the company. D1. Well, D1 is next year's dividend. The whole point behind this perpetuity formula is that it's based on an ex-div value. And therefore, the next dividend we can expect to receive will be in one year's time. We could always say that this is made up of DO, the current dividend, multiplied by 1 plus G. That's one period of growth. If you want to use that, that's absolutely fine. PO. That's the current share price. The share price today. As I've said, it is ex-div. As though the dividend has just been paid. If we were given the information come div, what we want to do is to take away one dividend to get to the ex-div value. And G... This is the dividend growth rate. Always be slightly careful with that, because the examiner may give you growth rates for dividends and growth rates for earnings that differ. It's always possible. Anything's possible. So, this is the basic formula that we have. The only issue, of course, we have is that the examiner may force us to have to manipulate some of these numbers. The obvious one for the examiner to pick would be the growth rate. So, if we were looking at calculating growth, there are two ways that we may be required to do so. On the one hand, we may use what is called the average method. We would use the average method if we were given dividends going back into the past. The idea with the average method is this. To get the growth rate, we look at the historic growth rate from today backwards a number of years, on the assumption that the growth rate in the past will continue into the future. So, this is if we're given... historical dividend data. If that's the case, this is Mickey Mouse. Very easy indeed. G will equal DO over DN to the power 1 over N minus 1. What do you think? Is that given to you? Well, of course not. Learn this. I've written the formula out in this manner, so it's dead easy to put into your calculator, because all calculators work differently. If we want to look at the detail, 
D0, of course, is the current dividend. Dn, the dividend. N periods ago. And N is, of course, the number of periods. The number of years between then and now. So, very straightforward, a nice, easy Mickey Mouse calculation. If you're given historical data on your dividends, that's what you do. There is an alternative, however. The alternative is where we use Gordon's growth estimate. Gordon's growth model. Here, we're given a very simple computation. G equals RB. If you wish, this is given in a subtly different form in the formula sheet. You don't have to remember this. I always write RB because I want to remember it as rhythm and blues. If we remember rhythm and blues, we're sorted. Now, if we look at Gordon's growth estimate, or model, R. R is some measure of return. If you think about it, we're valuing equity here. So it won't surprise you that when we look at return, we're looking at return on equity. You need to be able to calculate the return on equity. You have to remember the formula. I'm sure you do. Um, what we do is we take the profit after tax and divide through by equity. As simple as that. Multiply by 100, you get some sort of percentage. You see, the basis behind the Gordon's growth model is this. In order for a company to grow, firstly, it has to generate a return. Here, the return on equity. The second one is this. Not only does a company have to generate a return, but it has to take some of that return and reinvest it in the business. So B is simply the proportion retained. And if we're looking at the proportion retained, we would take retained earnings over profit after tax. Again, if we want it as a percentage, fine, multiply by 100. Now, we look at this estimate, and you could criticise it. You could say, why are we using some profit measure in order to get a growth rate for cost of equity? And the answer is, if you look at it theoretically, it's probably not a good methodology. It's probably not a good methodology because it's based on profit and it relates to a single year. But what we tend to find is that providing that year is representative of most years, it works very well. Because it, it's sort of self-cancelling in so much as if you have high growth, you'll have a lower dividend. And if you have low growth, you'll have a higher dividend. So by introducing this proportion ret retained here, it tends to work quite well in practice. So we've got two ways of calculating growth. This is not difficult, I hope. Remember, you're not expecting enormous mark allocation for anything we do with these KE computations. So let's move on. Now we can look at the alternative method. We can look at something called the CAPM. Now I don't want to get too excited about the CAPM because your examiner has written three articles. In fact, if we're going to talk about these articles now, I would go to the ACCA Global website. I hope you know where that is. And simply search for Tony Head, that's the name of the examiner, 
F9, and Cap M. If you search for those three, you will find that there are a series of three articles, starting from the very beginning of 2008 up to August 2008. You must read these articles in detail, because they weren't examined in June 2008 at all, even though two had already been published. That being the case, we must expect them to be examined fairly heavily this time. So, please note to do that. That is something for you to do, not difficult at all. What I want to focus on is what CAPM is all about. Now, if we're looking at capital asset pricing model, the idea is this. The single idea you have to get across to the examiner is this. We measure the cost of equity in terms of relative systematic risk to the market portfolio. Now, the only reason why I write the whole thing out here is this. I'm sort of expecting CAPM to come up big time this time. But not only that, everything I've said here has a substantial weighty idea behind it. First of all, systematic risk. The idea that we've used portfolio theory, and that allows us to eliminate the unsystematic portion and be left solely with the systematic portion. We must know about that. Secondly, relative. A key aspect of this technique, something fundamental to the CAPM, is the idea that we have established risk and return for the market portfolio. And given that we know risk and return for the market, we can now assess the degree of risk suffered by an individual company or later, individual project, and therefore assign it a measure of return in relation to that risk. So, relative risk, that is what the whole thing is about. Relative, well, I suppose I should say, relative systematic risk. So, very important indeed that we get this idea out. The other thing I would say, and I will not go into this in detail, is that you have to look at the advantages and disadvantages. I can't get excited about this. Your examiner is going to get excited about it in his article. The third article simply lists advantages and disadvantages of CAPM. And a lot more. You must know the 14 salient points that come out of that article. They're all very straightforward. We've got the underlying theory. We've got the comparison to the WAC, and we also have specific disadvantages or difficulties in applying the CAPM. Read the article, pick up the ideas, make sure you're ready to answer those in the exam. So, if we look at the CAPM, we start with these two ideas. But in essence, as a valuation tool, all we have to remember is this. KE equals RF plus beta RM minus RF. Now this is given. This is given in the formula sheet. It's not a big issue, um, although the examiner describes things in subtly different ways. I like this format. I find it easier to interpret and easier for everybody else to understand. And I'm sure your examiner would be perfectly happy if you end up writing this down. Remember, what we're looking at is RF, the risk-free rate. The risk-free rate is typically given by short-dated government bonds, or what we may tend to call nowadays treasury bills, RM. This is the return 
from the market portfolio. Not a big issue, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. These are going to have to be given to you. And beta, well this is our relative risk measure. So it's not going to be difficult at all. All we do is pluck the numbers out of the question, throw them in the formula, and bang, we get our cost of equity. Nothing difficult. In fact, almost embarrassingly easy. So, we've looked at the dividend valuation model. Not much to remember, maybe have to calculate a bit of growth. We've looked at the cap -M. Incredibly easy to apply, but quite a lot of depth. I would talk about the depth, but for the articles. Now let's look at KD. KD, all we're looking at here is the cost of debt. If we're focusing on the cost of debt, well, this is easy peasy lemon squeezy. To focus on the cost of debt, what we need is to look at all the different types of debt. But before we start with this, let's just consider the, I the basic ideas of traded debt. Now, I'm not talking the absolute truth here, I'm talking the realistic exam truth. So, if we're looking at traded debt, the first thing we would say is that they have a par or nominal value of, well, in the exam, $100. Everything is in dollars. Okay? Very straightforward. Secondly, we would expect them to be fixed interest. That means that regardless of what happens to the interest rates, the amount that is paid by you, the debt holder, the company, will be the same each and every year. Now, you could argue about both these elements, but I'm not going to. Now, the first thing we would have to do is to consider irredeemable debt. If we're looking at irredeemable debt, the whole issue about it is that it is not redeemed, not surprisingly with such a title. Do we expect debt to be irredeemable? Well, the answer is no. In the real world, there is very little irredeemable debt floating around. Maybe a little bit of government debt relating to many years past, but beyond that, virtually nothing. Almost anybody who lends money would expect that money to be returned at some point in the future. But the examiner may decide to use irredeemable debt simply because it's a simple one marker and he's got no other marks to play with. So if we were looking at irredeemable debt, all we have to do here is to establish KD by taking I over PO. We already know what PO is. This is the price of the debt today. Um, I suppose instead of X div, as we said before, we could talk about X int after the interest has been paid. There's only one thing I would like to add here. Whenever we look at debt, we know that it is tax deductible, or at least the interest is. And from that perspective, we would normally have to take away the amount for tax. Remember, this is simply because interest is paid pre-tax, whereas dividends are paid post-tax. Okay? And it relates to the fact that debt holders are not part owners of the business. So, we have our formula here, and I don't think I really have to describe anything too much. I, of course, is the interest. The other term you may come across is coupon. Because of its fixed nature, we simply multiply the interest rate, the percentage, by the nominal or par value of 100. 1 minus T, of course, T is the tax rate. KD, I think, is straightforward, cost of debt. And PO, we've sort of discussed already, the market value of the debt at a point in time. So, do I expect irredeemable debt to come up? The answer is no, but we have to be ready 
for a specific trick where we may have to use this formula. So if I leave that note, we can move on and consider the next one. Redeemable debt. Now, if we focus on redeemable debt, the whole basis behind it is that, yes, we will redeem it at some point in the future. As such, there are three cash flows. One, the market value today. Two, the interest paid each and every year. And three, the redemption value. Now, the only way that we can calculate the cost of debt is by getting the internal rate of return of those. Yes? The IRR. And if we remember, to calculate the IRR, what we do is we take the lower rate plus the net present value at the lower rate over the net present value of the lower rate minus the net present value of the higher rate multiplied by H, the higher rate, minus L, the lower rate. So, that's what we have to do. And the issue I have with this is that we have very few marks to play with. So we've got to get this sort of computation out in very short order indeed. As such, we're not going to waste time with any clever bits. All we're going to do is to have a step-by-step -step approach of how we deal all of the, with all of these. Right. If we're looking at the steps, the first thing that we do is to draw up seven columns. You see, what we need to do is to calculate an IRR. And to calculate an IRR, we will need two net present values. So we'll need quite a lot of workings here. We'll talk about what those seven columns include in a moment. Once we've got our seven columns up, we then identify the cash flows. We identify what the cash flows are each year and the years to which they relate. Shouldn't be too difficult. We bang them into the seven columns. Thirdly, we discount. Now, I could give you very complicated rules on this, but we do not have the time to do that. So what we're going to do each and every time is to discount at 5% and 10%. The reason why we discount at 5 and 10 is that we expect your examiner to be fairly realistic. And if you look at most debt, it will be somewhere between 5 and 10. If we discount at 5 and 10, we don't really have to think too much. Thinking is a way of slowing things down. So if we don't think, life's a lot easier. And if we end up with two positive NPVs, or two negative NPVs, that's not a problem. We throw them into the IRR formula and we get the result. We can get a result regardless of what happens. So don't worry, it's a bit rough and ready, but it means that we can get the numbers out very quickly in the exam, which is important. Once we've discounted at 5 and 10%, then we slot everything into the IRR formula. So, to give you an indication of the sort of thing that we would do here, not difficult at all, the first column is the year. The second column is the information column. The third column would be cash flow. And then we have two columns at 5% and two columns at 10%. Remember, we need the discount factor from the tables and the present value. And the discount factor from the tables and the present value. So those are the seven columns I always expect you to do.
don't bother thinking, don't try to be clever, simply get the numbers down and see what you can do. If I were to just suggest some numbers, year zero, we have the current market value. Now, I'm just suggesting these numbers, plucking them out of the air, but let's say that the current market value was £110. To make life easy when it comes to interpretation, we make that negative, which may look odd to some of you, but don't worry about it. Always make the market value negative and the other two components positive. Okay? Let's suggest that we're earning interest for six years. We would earn interest for each year from year one to year six. So, of course, this is an annuity. Typically, what we would have is something like this. Interest at 8%. 8% of $100 gives us $8. But hold on a moment. We would normally multiply by 1 minus the tax rate. 1 minus... 0.3? Of course, tax doesn't have to be 30%, but in every question so far it has been. If we, if we multiply this one through, what do we get? 5.6, something like that. And then, in year 6, we have the redemption value. Let's suggest we are redeeming, I don't know, at a premium of 20%. 20% more than the par value is 120, and that's what you've got. You read the information straight out of your tables to get these values, and once you've got that, you can get these values. You will end up with a net present value here and a net present value here. And once you've got your net present values, and your costs, you can slap that into the IRR formula and score some marks. So, this is what the examiner will ask you to do on a regular basis. I don't think it's difficult. I think we should get it right. The issue is, for too many people, it's too slow. That you spend so much time getting this right, that you waste time that you need elsewhere. And that is the reason why you've got to follow some sort of very simplistic way of dealing with these questions. And that's what I've tried to do here. It's not perfect by any means. But the great thing about ACCA is you do not need perfection. Providing your answer is approximately correct, you're going to get the marks. So, we've looked at redeemable debt. It's always possible that the examiner will ask about this. But, there's one situation where using seven columns is not necessary. In a circumstance where the residual value is the same as the market value, you don't need to use the IRR formula. You don't need to do all of this. And this is one of the tricks that you've got to be ready for. The simple trick is this. Do you remember we had irredeemable debt before? Well, the trick is simply this we can use the irredeemable debt formula if the market value equals the redemption value. And that's quite important. Not because you won't get the right number the other way, you will. But, I've got a feeling that slapping numbers into this formula is a lot easier than slapping in numbers into the seven columns and calculating the IRR. So if we pick up in the question that the market value and the redemption value are the same, bang, use the formula, and give everybody a wave in the exam hall, 
to show off to the fact that you picked on, up on something that they will not have. So, it saves you time. That's the trick. Nothing more than that. Um, what else have we got? Well, we've got convertibles as well. If we're looking at convertibles, I'd simply say it's as per redeemable debt. We're going to do the same sort of thing. But... What's the issue with convertibles? Well, the issue is simply this. The debt holder is able to decide what they do. They make a choice. They can either decide to hold the debt instrument until it is redeemed, or they can decide to convert into shares. So before we get to the seven columns, what we have to decide is what is that final cash flow? Will it be the redemption value, because the debt is redeemed, or will it be a conversion value, because they'll be converted into shares? As per redeemable debt, but before, if you wish, seven columns, we make a choice. And that is, we either redeem or we convert. Which one do we pick? Do we pick the higher or the lower value? Well, yes, we pick the higher value. We pick the higher value because it's the debt holder making the decision. So we choose the higher value. There may be a little faffing around there, but whatever happens, we just keep on going. Yes? Um, if you were the examiner, what would you always get the debt holder to do? Redeem or convert? Well, I think so. I think that most examiners, most of the time, will want you to convert. Because, of course, that requires a little bit more computation. We've dealt with convertibles. Nothing difficult there. What else can we look at? Well, we could always focus on bank loans. Bank loans are incredibly easy indeed. The reason why they're easy is this. They're not traded. Therefore, the amount that you borrow is the amount that you pay back. And at any point during the, the time between borrowing and paying back, we would assume that the bank loan is worth the same. As such, KD is simply this. KD is simply the interest or coupon rate. So don't go off into some flight of fancy you know, half the people in the exam hall will be excited by doing seven columns or something like this. You know, if it is not traded, you've already got the rate of return. Finally, we could also look at preference shares. If we're focusing on preference shares, we want to calculate KP. Yes, cost of preference shares. And all we have to remember here is that preference shares don't have any tax issue. Remember, they pay a dividend, don't they, post-tax. Also, preference shares do not grow in any way. The dividend is fixed. That's the key aspect of preference shares. So all we have is a simple perpetuity formula. D over PO. Couldn't be easier. If preference shares comes up and you need KP, bosh, it's as simple as that. So, I'm just trying to remind you of those key weapons you need in your armory. If you've got your toolkit full of these little ideas, dealing with anything in the exam should not be a major issue. Okay, one aspect of F9 that we have to be absolutely on top of are the three articles. The articles all relate 
to the capital asset pricing model. Article 1 is an introduction. Of course, elements of Article 1 could easily be examined, but I think it's the least important of the three. Article 2 is where we look specifically at project specific discount rates. Now this has exam question written all over it. I expect your examiner to go big on this area this time. And thirdly, it's all about the advantages and the disadvantages. The advantages and disadvantages of CAPM, as far as I'm concerned, you can read. That's not a difficult issue. So, looking at these articles, what do you need to absolutely know in order that you're ready for anything that the examiner may throw at you? Well, let's start with Article 1. Just as a point of reference, Article 1 was published in early 2008 and is called the Cost of Equity. Search for it on the ACCA website. I'm not going to go through it word by word by word because you might as well read it. All I wanted to do was to show you what it looks like in order that you know whether your search is successful or not. The aspects that I would suggest are important in Article 1 is that you must be able to discuss risk in terms of the systematic and the unsystematic portion. Now, what I would like you to do is to try and get the ideas that the examiner has written down in your head. So rather than me telling you something else, read the article and paraphrase it yourself. Remember, what he says is going to be similar to what I say, but you want to say precisely what he says because imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I suppose if the examiner can think of nothing else to discuss, we should be ready to discuss a little bit about the risk-free rate. There's a discussion point as to where it comes from and maybe what sort of values we would expect. Also, the equity risk premium. Your examiner has gone a bit large here. The risk-free rate RF, equity risk premium, the difference between RM and RF. Okay? He's interested in these things, therefore you've got to be able to talk about them. The other thing that you have to be able to consider is the asset beta formula. Now remember, the asset beta formula is given to you in your formula sheet. But simply a glance at the asset beta formula is enough to make most people pale. We have something like this. I'm sure you're all absolutely familiar with it. In that article, there are some numbers that you can slot into the asset beta formula. It's not something that the examiner appears to be t too thrilled about, but he felt he had to do. There is something very interesting about all three articles. And that is this. Throughout the articles, we are talking about equity beaters and asset beaters. But the one thing that the examiner makes no reference to 
whatsoever throughout the articles is the debt beater. And my suggestion is this. My suggestion, as the second article already highlights, is that he's not going to give a debt beater in any complex manner whatsoever, unless it is simply a case of slotting the information in to the answer. That's it. Nothing more than that. Okay? So please don't worry too much about it. But we might as well be ready for it just in case. So make sure that you can slot numbers into the formula and you know what this is, the asset beta. So, that's Article 1. I don't think Article 1's too great, but let's face it, if there are a few marks, a few freebies on offer by the examiner, we want to pick them up. What we want to look at now is our next formula. Our next article. Article 2. Again, let's just make sure we can pick up on Article 2 so we know what it looks like when we read it ourselves. Project Specific Discount Rates is its title. Now, this article from an exam perspective is far more pertinent. As such, what I want to do is to take a couple of points from it. The first one is simply up here at the top of the article. You can read it when you access the website at the ACCA. But all that tells us is that it is common practice that the debt beta is ignored. Okay? Now, I think what the examiner is saying is that it's common practice to ignore the debt beta, therefore he intends to ignore the debt beta. And that's very important. Just going back to what we were talking about a second ago, if there is no debt beta, the value is zero. And therefore all of that becomes zero. And suddenly, the asset beta formula becomes a lot easier indeed for us to play with. And this is what I expect. Although, although that's the formula given to you, I'm expecting in the exam that you can quite happily ignore the right-hand side and all you have to remember is the relationship between the asset beta and the equity beta. So that's the first thing that I'm very interested in about this article. Beyond that, what else do we need to know? Well, we're given a long discussion here about proxy companies and proxy beaters. I think it's quite an interesting discussion, and so I would make sure that you are able to reproduce something like it. Okay? I can't see there's anything majorly computational about it, but there may be a brief discussion for two to three, four, uh, two, three or four marks. But the thing that interests me more than anything else is on the second page. And if we look at the second page, what we're given are the steps that your examiner expects you to do. And everything about this and the subsequent question, to me, absolutely stinks of an exam question that your examiner is going to ask. So, this is what your examiner wants you to do. First of all, lo locate suitable proxy companies. Fine. So what we're doing is we're saying, um, if we're setting a new project up in a particular industry, we need to know about companies in that industry because they would have the same systematic risk. Once we've done that, determine the equity beaters of the proxy companies, their, their gearings and the tax rates. Well, that's not a problem. In fact, it's almost too easy. They'll be given to us, bosh, bosh, bosh. Step three, 
ungear the proxy equity betas to obtain asset betas. Oh, you see, when we look at the proxy values that we're given, the proxy values will include the equity beta, which is made up of two elements of risk, the systematic risk and the financial risk. So what we want to do there is to de-gear, get rid of the financial risk, and therefore only be left with the systematic risk. Remember, the key quality of the systematic risk is that it's the same for all companies within the same industry. What do we have to do next? Well, we now have to calculate an average, a simple average. We've stripped away the financial risk. Therefore, we've only got the systematic risk. But we will have done this two or three times to get some sort of proxy value from a number of these companies. If that's the case, what we now want to do is to average those asset beaters to get some sort of representative number. So we've got a representative number, an asset beta for the industry. Now we go back to our own company and say, well, hold on, our own company's got its own financial risk. So we want to add in our own financial risk to get the equity beta for our company. That's called re-gearing. And then finally, use the CAPM, very straightforward, to calculate a project-specific cost of equity job done. So, this smacks of what your examiner wants. Very importantly, what your examiner wants, and look at those steps. Those are six discrete mark allocations that the examiner is interested in giving. Just so you have the numbers yourself, although we'll be doing this in a moment, please note, there is an example here. And I really would not be surprised if the example given at the bottom of the middle column and the top of the final column is precisely what your examiner is going to examine this time. I can't promise anything, but to me it looks like a perfect mark allocation for the substantial part of a question. And if that's the case, we must make sure that we can score it. In fact, if I were to guess and remember, this is just a guess, an educated guess, but guess nonetheless. If you've got a 25 mark question, is it possible that you'll be asked to do some sort of whack computation? Maybe quite a simple one for seven marks. Then you do your project specific discount rate for maybe, what, nine marks. And then we'll have some theory bit, probably still in the same area, for a further nine marks. I don't know if I'm correct, but that's the sort of thing that I really wouldn't be surprised about at all. What do we need to know about Article 2? Well, the first thing, very importantly, is that the debt beta is ignored. Or should I say, the debt beta is ignored if the question is complex in any way. Secondly, we have six steps wanted by the examiner. If the examiner wants those six steps, you want to give those six steps. And thirdly, there is a specific question that you have to be ready for. Right, so make sure you read the article in detail. I can tell you what to look at, but I cannot read it for you. The final article.
Well, funnily enough, Article 3 is very straightforward, but probably there is more examinable content in Article 3 than the other two articles put together. So if we were to just briefly look at it, and remember, I'm not going to get excited about reading through. You can do that yourself. I'm simply highlighting the salient points. We've got a slightly different format, because we've obviously got a new format for student accountant. The first area you've got to be hot on are the CAPM assumptions. There are four basic assumptions. They're all given in the article there. Make sure you know them. Very importantly, the assumptions don't just need to be stated. But you've also got to describe whether the assumptions are acceptable or not, whether they are reflective of real life. And note, all of this is in the article. You don't have to make it up. It is all suggested there. So read it carefully. Make your own notes. The second thing we have to know is WAC and the CAPM. Which is better and why? And the basic argument is that the CAPM is theoretically superior to the weighted average cost of capital at any point outside the company's own cost of capital. And if you wish, there is a beautiful diagram to assist you here. The fourth area, the advantages of the CAPM. Know them. Learn them, write them down, and know them. Because you know there is a solid chance of them coming up. And the fifth area, the disadvantages of the CAPM. And this simply states that it's difficult to apply. How do we calculate RF? How do we calculate RM, or at least the risk premium, and things like that? So, to recap, Article 3. Firstly, we need to know the theory of the CAPM. Once we know the theory, we can look at the assumptions. But I'm quite sure the examiner will not just say, state the assumptions. Instead, the examiner is likely to talk about, discuss the assumptions. And therefore, I suppose we're looking at the weaknesses within the assumptions. Yes? Do they reflect reality? Thirdly, WAC versus CAPM. The answer being CAPM is theoretically superior, but WAC is still an acceptable methodology in some circumstances. And four, very simple this, just learn them. What are the advantages and what are the disadvantages? Now, I'm expecting at least one of these components to come up in the exam. And it's very possible more than one will come up. So be ready for them.